Thank you all for being here today. What a grand and awe-inspiring presentation our guest speaker has for you today. Dr. Will Tuttle is an educator, composer, pianist, and writer. He is author of the number one Amazon bestseller, The World Peace Diet, which has been published in 16 languages. And it will be available for sale right in the back there after the presentation. As a peace activist and vegan for 37 years, Will is the recipient of the Courage of Conscience Award and the Empty Cages Award. He is also creator of the World Peace Diet training programs. Will has a PhD from UC Berkeley focusing on educating, intuition, and altruism. He has taught college courses in philosophy, humanities, mythology, and comparative religion. Dr. Tuttle is a former Zen monk and Dharma master in the Korean Zen tradition and is co-founder of the Worldwide Prayer Circle for Animals. We are thrilled, thrilled to have him and his spouse Madeline, a visionary artist, as you can see, from Switzerland here with us today. Will is presenting Healing Our World, A Deeper Look at Food. Like his book, The World Peace Diet, Will and Madeline are classics. Please join us in welcoming today's speaker, our friend, Dr. Will Tuttle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn Silden, and thank you all for coming out here this afternoon. Let's give a big hand to Lynn. I know she's worked really hard, and everyone is here. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that Madeline and I like to do uh, in, in traveling actually around North America uh, is to uh, support local uh, groups, like even in bringing the message at, at a grassroots level, because I think really the grassroots is where it's at in terms of social change, positive social change, when we get together like this in, in libraries and, and uh, yoga studios and all kinds of different places. and, and um, discuss the issues that are most essential. So the plan for me today is to give a, a short lecture, a presentation, talk about some of the main ideas in the World Peace Diet, and then open it up for some questions. And uh, just so I have a feeling, how many of you have actually read the book that we just heard about, The World Peace Diet? Just so I have a feeling. Yeah, some of you have. Great. So um, the basic idea in the World Peace Diet that I'll be focusing on is to understand the, the nature of our society, of our culture. The, the basic idea, I think, really is that we're all born into a culture that we uh, could, could call a herding culture, that is based at its core on owning animals as property for food that is invisible. It's hidden from us, essentially. We don't think of ourselves as living in a herding culture. We think, no, no, we, we live in a modern, high-tech kind of society. <laughs> but actually, it's a herding culture. The herding of animals is now industrialized, and the animals are imprisoned in, uh, in cages uh, by the thousands or tens of thousands. And it's pretty much out of sight and out of mind. But go into pretty much any building anywhere, and you'll find the flesh and secretions of these um, abused animals. And we're not just doing that. We're, of course, eating that and feeding that to our children. And so the basic idea is to understand what are the consequences of this and why it is so difficult for us to come to terms with this effectively uh, because the underlying idea, as Lynn mentioned, is healing, healing our world. How can we heal ourselves, our society, our relationship with the planet, with ecosystems, with an other animals, and uh, really with hungry people, with, with workers, there's a whole web of relations that comes out of food. And food is actually our most intimate connection, as I think we all know intuitively, with nature. Right? You can't get more intimate with someone than eating <laughs> them, right? It's very intimate. So it's a very intimate connection with, with nature and with our society. Anthropologists actually understand that the primary way that any culture transmits its values from generation to generation is through rituals, right? The rituals of any society. 
And the primary rituals in any society are the meals. When people get together and eat food, we're not just eating food, we're eating belief systems, we're eating attitudes, we're eating uh, paradigms, you know, they're, they're cultural patterns that basically tell us our relationships with each other, with nature, with animals, uh, with the cosmos, the divine, whatever, all of that is in the meals. So what I've discovered actually over the last, I've been a vegan now for almost 40 years, uh, I just, you know, and I, I, in a way I don't like the word, I, like, I love the word vegan, but I don't like it in, in the sense that it, sometimes it creates categories. And so basically for me it's just simply coming home to I think really what is our true nature, to just see beings as beings and not see them as food or as objects to be used. And uh, so this practice to me uh, is the practice of tr making an effort to become more conscious and mindful of cultural programming and realize, because what I discovered, and I think we all know this intuitively, is when we leave here and we go out into the world and we see people going into supermarkets and restaurants and buying meat and dairy products and eggs, that there's really essentially one reason that people do that. And that one reason is that they're following orders. These are orders that were essentially uh, injected into us very early on from infancy by people we trust very deeply, our own parents and teachers, neighbors and friends and relatives, the clergy, the doctors, the government officials, the ads on TV, you know, there's a total complete agreement essentially in our society that this is what we eat to get enough protein and get enough calcium and makes us real people and so forth and that the animals were give, sort of given to us uh, to do this. There's, there's religious justification for it, there's medical justification, there's all these justifications and rationalizations why this is what we do, and we do not like to have this question. So the fact that you found your way into this room shows to me, anyway, that you're already adventurous spirits. You're still sitting here while I'm saying all this, and you're <laughs> willing to question probably the you know the deepest programming in our society is uh, to essentially you know sort of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? Don't pay no attention to what's going on behind the curtain because. What's going on behind the curtain is hard to look at in our society. So for me, uh, just very briefly, I was born and raised in New England back in the 1950s. And I remember growing up in a family that ate the usual meals. That everybody eats lots of meat, dairy products, and eggs. And I didn't question it because I had no uh, framework for, for questioning this. And I remember when I was about seven years old, I just was getting a little curious, I guess, and I said to my mother, uh, I asked her, the kind of food we're eating, is this what everybody eats? And she affirmed immediately, this is really, this is human food, this is what everybody eats. And she came back a couple of minutes later after I thanked her for her imparting her wisdom to me. <laughs> and she said, well, actually, you know, that's not completely true. There are vegetarians. And I was, never heard that big word before. I said, what's a vegetarian? And she said, you know, don't worry about it. You're never going to meet one. <laughs> and then she said, you know, I'm a lot older than you are, and I never met one. And then she said, I don't know where, where they get their protein. And they, they just eat vegetables. And I, and I thought, wow, strange people. I pictured people that are kind of dragging themselves around, you know, please, does anyone have any spare protein I can have? I, I, I don't know, I can't get the protein. And so I, that was really, for me, that was pretty much the end of it. You know, I was, it was, again, it was something that was not in, in common discourse or any discourse. And I go, a little older, um, when I was in my early teens, I remember going away uh, several summers to a summer camp in, uh, nestled in the Green Mountains of Vermont, uh, affiliated with this uh, organic dairy, you know, one of those beautiful little farms where nothing bad would ever happen. <laughs> and, uh, but I was, I was taught how to catch a chicken and put her down and have my axe and, you know, cut her head off and put her through the sculling tank and we would eat the chickens and it was kind of teaching us how to, uh, you know, where food comes from in a sense. And it was, for me, it was very eye-opening and shocking and very, um, I didn't like it, but, I never questioned the rightness of it because at that point, think of it, I've gone through 13 years of really what amounts to the most intense indoctrination a human being can go through in many ways. I and mean, I was eating routinely and relentlessly, day after day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, in the company of people I trust completely, my own parents and teachers and ministers and doctors, you know, everybody, neighbors and friends, the flesh of animals, the secretions of animals, and I was you know, eating the stories that 
God gave us these animals to eat. They do not have a soul like we do. They are, uh, in, you know, very, you know, infinitely inferior to us. And and if you don't eat them, you will definitely die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency. <laughs> Guaranteed, you will die. <laughs> So that was the story. So I, you know, it was an unpleasant thing to do, but I thought, okay, we'll do that. But then I remember uh, even gathering around a dairy cow. I won't go into it in detail because it's uh, not very pleasant. But but just you know, gathering around a dairy cow. And this cow, as most dairy cows are, are not was not very old when it was time for her to be killed. She was only about five years old. Uh, but dairy on any operation, um, organic or not, when cows get to be about five years old, or goats, any of these animals. They are killed, even though they would live, you know, 20, 25, 30 years naturally. They're, by that point, their production has declined. Their babies have been routinely stolen from them. They're impregnated against their will, and what the industry refers to as rape racks. Then, after nine months of gestation, they give birth to a baby, and they want nothing more than to nurse that baby. And Madeline and I actually lived about 18 years in an RV, and we parked sometimes near dairies, and we would hear the, the cows uh, calling all night, sometimes bellowing and crying for their babies and so um, I you know I, I didn't really see that part of it because I was only there uh, for a few weeks but I saw the part where it's time for us uh, now to kill the cow because she's five years old and she, her production is now has declined because you can imagine uh, for any uh, female mammal if, if they're pregnant and lactating simultaneously that breaks down the health of any female mammal very quickly they're not, we're really not designed for that so we put a gun to her head and pulled the trigger and, and killed her and butchered her right there on the floor of the barn. And it was shocking to me to, to go through that, but I thought, well, that's what you got to do. You know, it's, this is, and, and I was a tough young 13-year-old kid, and I participated in the whole thing. And uh, I went away to college, and, and I began, it was 1970, early 1970s, and, and there was a time of questioning, you know, Vietnam War and all that. And I remember there were actually some vegetarians on campus. I never, it was like my mother said, I never actually saw one. I never met one, but I heard there were some there somewhere. <laughs> and, but then, right after that, we, my brother and I decided to go on a spiritual pilgrimage. And we left home, and we thought we would walk all the way to California, right? It was just going to be this big... And we ended up getting as far as Buffalo, New York. But in Buffalo, we headed south and we walked, uh, ended up walking all the way to Alabama. And on the way, we stayed for a while in a community called The Farm. And this was 1975. And The Farm at that point in uh, summer, just Summertown, Tennessee, was the largest, uh, basically, what you, I guess you would say, a hippie commune in the world. About almost At that point, there was almost a thousand people there. And they were all vegetarians. Right? And actually, quite honestly, they were vegans in the sense that they didn't eat meat or dairy or eggs. So no animal foods. And uh, so I, I saw these people, they had about 200 children who were basically vegan from birth. They were all thriving. And no one was dragging themselves around saying, hey, I need some protein help. You know, <laughs> They were doing actually great. And I remember uh, talking to them about it and saying, why are you guys vegetarians? Uh, because in our spiritual pilgrimage, I had I was more and more feeling uncomfortable with killing animals and eating animal foods. It was just coming to me. I remember fishing, catching some fish, and then I had to kill the fish. And I was like, here I am meditating and praying for world peace, and I'm beating and killing. And I I didn't like it, but I thought I you know had to do it to to be healthy. So they explained to me basically that most of the food that we're growing on this earth uh, we're feeding to animals. And that's causing food shortages, and that people are going hungry because the wealthier, uh, civil, uh, the more industrialized nations are taking most of the grain. And these food shortages are the driving force behind war and conflict. And they were really committed to creating more peace in the world, so they were eating lower on the food chain so there would be enough food for everyone to eat. And I remember thinking deeply about that and thinking, gosh, you know, that's very noble, and I, I wish I knew about that earlier. And I said, okay, what's the other reason? Because I remember the guy I was talking to said, there's two reasons. The other reason he said is, do you know what the animals go through for food? And I said, I don't want to hear about it. Don't tell me. But he, he said just a few things and, and mentioned some of the routine mutil mutilations that are performed on animals, you know, the beaking and tail docking and castrating and all of this. And it was enough for me to visualize, I think in a way for the first time in my life, this massive horrific hell realm that we force literally millions and millions of animals into. It was kind of like, you know, like I said earlier, on The Wizard of Oz when Toto pulls the curtain back and, and I saw this. 
And it was very disturbing to me to realize that my culture, you know, like behind the nightly news, we talk about everything that's happening in the news, but they never talk about that, right? What's really the real thing? This is the biggest thing we're doing, really. I mean, this is the largest activity human beings are engaged in, in terms of land and everything. It's water, petroleum, it's the, the biggest thing we're doing, and yet we just ignore it very assiduously. <laughs> So, but for me, I got a glimpse of it. I just let myself open up to it. And I think it was because of this community, because every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I was sitting with these people at these, in these big tables eating vegetables. And, and uh, the, the very first things, I mean, we, we, you know, back then, they, everybody thought if you didn't eat a lot of soybeans, you'd probably die, right? So you, <laughs> we were eating lots of soybeans. You'd cook them for 12 hours, I remember. My pressure cooker was great because you can cook them for an hour. We cooked everything on wood, so it was nice to have a pressure cooker. But I remember we made the very first um, soy ice, first, first, yeah, first soy ice cream that had ever been made. And uh, it was really terrible, but, you know, we thought, well, it's pretty good, you know? It's, Vegetarian, we said it's vegetarian, and uh, it was you know you take some soy some soybeans and you cook them and you squeeze them and you get this milk and you take the milk and then you put some thickener and some sugar and you freeze it and you eat it and you go wow we got you know vegetarian ice cream, <laughs> but it's great to see how far we've come you know since then in terms of the deliciousness of uh, of vegan ice cream, but um, but when I was there you know that that really was the turning point for me I mean. It, since that day, I was talking to that guy in 1975, I have never eaten meat in my life, right? So that's 42 years ago. And um, uh, a few years later, uh, I was in California at that point, in San Francisco Bay Area, and I, and I just learned more about dairy and egg production, and so I became a vegan in uh, 1980. And a few years later, I went to Korea. I, I was, had been living in, in meditation center, so I shaved my head and became a Zen monk. And for the second time in my life, I was in a community that ate a completely, you know, was, was what we would call a vegan community. And they were practicing this for about 800 years, right? This was an eight, this is since the 1200s. And I realized, I, was, I just got back from China, our second time in China. We're going twice a year now to China. And I was able just, you know, last month to visit monasteries in China where they've been practicing veganism since like the year 600 or something, I'm going way back. No meat, no dairy, no eggs, no wool, no silk, no leather, you know, this whole way of living based on an ancient wisdom teaching that if we're really serious about personal uh, growth, about uh, being conscious, being mindful, being uh, awake and aware, and also contributing to creating a world of harmony, then the foundation of that is respect and kindness for other living beings, beings who are sentient. No, nothing to do with like humans and animals, it's all sentient beings. In other words, if a being is capable of suffering, then, then you don't hurt them, right? I mean, all of us, I think, how many of you have a companion animal of some kind, like a dog or a cat? Some of you, so you know what I'm talking about, right? This is not just a little sack of cement you can kick around or, or you know, kill. These are, there's someone in there looking out of those eyes and she, has interests, right? And her interests are that she's not abused physically or psychologically. You don't lock her in a closet and make her live in her own excrement, right? That's what we, but we do these things to literally billions of beings who are just as sentient as our dogs and cats and our children and we are, essentially. They, they are the subjects of their lives and they, I mean, I love these paintings by Madeline behind me because I think we, you know, we can look into the eyes of these beings and it's been so great we've been able to visit animal sanctuaries all over the United States, in Africa, in Australia, New Zealand, in uh, the Middle East, and, you know, in um, everywhere, China, Korea. And there are places where people you know, save a few of the animals and take care of them. And you can you know, rub a pig's belly or get to know a cow or a chicken and see that every, you know, they, and that's what we hear all the time and we experience it, how they have different personalities and, and uh, but they are definitely sentient beings. So for me, uh, being in Korea as a Zen monk in this um, in this situation was very um, liberating in the, in the sense that it was an opportunity to not only feel into an, a, a culture where this had been practiced for centuries, but also to be part of that myself. In other words, every day we would get up at three o'clock in the morning and start meditating until nine o'clock at night. So it was just. This, this time of, of quite a few, you know, over three months, I did this one practice there, I remember. So it was a practice of, of introspection, essentially, just, in, just looking within. And one of the things that I really emphasize, I think, to everyone, if possible, is the importance 
of understanding ourselves. You know, there's this old uh, saying over the temple at Delphi, uh, Gnathi Sutan, it means know thyself. That, uh, that idea that unless we examine ourselves or make an effort to understand ourselves, it's difficult to really to live a life of authenticity and meaning because as soon as I'm born, I, my mind is, starts to get programmed, right? I mean, and there's nothing necessarily bad or wrong about this. Wherever we're born in any society, we become products of that culture, right? We, their language becomes my language, their food becomes my food, their way of thinking, their attitudes become my way of thinking and my attitudes. And, and so for me in that monastery, I realized that my mind had been colonized, essentially. I mean, it, it was like, I, my, all my thoughts, everything, my values, everything in many ways came from my parents, my teachers, the corporate ads I was watching, you know, all this stuff, living in this society. And so for to have literally thousands of hours of sitting in meditation, bringing my mind back, back to the present moment and just reflecting on consciousness, it, I began to get a glimpse of a deeper truth that what we are is infinite consciousness. Like what we are is the sky. It's totally free and liberated. That's our true nature. But we really, at a deep level, we are not born and we don't die. We are life manifesting, but we are born into a culture that has at its very deep root a, sen um, a teaching of materialism, that we're just a thing, an object. Because what, what are we eating? We're eating objects, right? We, we taught at a very deep level that these cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys and ducks and geese and fishes, they're just pieces of meat. And we're taught as a little kid. I remember learning as a little boy, or as a young man, uh, in the locker rooms of the college, you know, and, and high school uh, athletic uh, uh, places. You know, the, the girls are just pieces of meat. You know, the, we, and, we, and in a sense, we're we're taught to see others as objects, instruments that we can use for our own benefit. We're raised to, to put value on it and to sell ourselves on the market and look at others as objects to be used. But this, at a very deep level, comes from the uh, herding culture that, at its very core, is reducing beings to things, that mentality of reducing beings to things. And so through, I think through introspection, we can begin to break free of that prison uh, of reducing ourselves and others to material objects and to see that there is a being worthy of respect, a sacred expression of life, and that this whole earth is an absolute celebration of beauty and of celebrations of life that are magnificent. And we human beings seem to be doing, in a sense, um, spending most of our energy destroying this beautiful celebration and symphony of life here. We're overfishing the oceans to the point where uh, scientists say that they're basically on the brink of complete annihilation. Most of the major so-called fisheries of the earth are in complete collapse and are dying. And the rainforest we're cutting down now at an acre per second. This is causing the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. All of this is driven, you know, the depletion of water and the pollution of water and air and the massive uh, soil erosion. All of these things are directly attributable to people taking out their wallets and paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs, which cause this kind of environmental devastation. And yet the whole thing is basically covered up because the, there are institutions that don't, don't really want us to be aware of this. And we ourselves are born into a culture where we're taught not to reflect on this, and not to really reflect on the deeper aspect of life. To not to see beings as sacred expressions of life, but to see them as instruments to be used, because we're eating that every day. So it's a very subconscious kind of a, of a program that's inject. It's really, in a sense, you know, inserted into us um, as we're compelled to participate in these meals. We don't really have a choice. I remember as a little kid, I didn't have a choice <laughs> about this. In fact, I remember at one point I was in this kind of strange position where I was the older brother. Maybe I was six or so. Maybe that's why I asked my mother, you know, is this why everybody eats? Because I remember my little sister was sitting in the high chair, and my mother said, you can feed your little sister. And I thought, okay, good, I'm the big, I'm the big brother, I'll feed my little sister. And, and my, my mother always uh, kind of warned me. She said, but make sure she eats her protein, because that was the problem. You know, I'd, kept, I'd feed her the different foods, and when it ever came to the meat, she always went, she kept spitting it out. <laughs> 
oh, you know. So I was, you know, making your, I was trying to get her to eat the protein. I got very creative. I said, here comes the protein. I made like an airplane. You know, it was really fun. Here comes the protein. It's the best part. And she'd go, hit it. <laughs> you gotta eat. You know, so I, at one point, I was literally forcing it down her throat. You know, I said, you gotta get this. I, you know, if, if you die because you don't eat the protein, my and mom blames it on me. You know, I, it's not going to happen. You got to eat this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm so glad I can stand in front of you today and say, my little sister finally went vegan. <laughs> I, I took a little, took a little work. Madeline and I had to kind of show her some videos and kind of really, you know, and and she went vegan um, quite a, you know, probably almost 20 years ago now. And uh, her daughter is a vegan also. And, my, and her daughter, Christy, um, now has uh, two kids, <laughs> and they're vegan from birth. So, uh, and my mother even went vegan too. So we have uh, four generations of vegans. And again, it doesn't always work that way, but for us, I feel I feel very fortunate. Madeline's mother recently passed away in her 98th year, and she was also had been a vegan for the last 15 years. My mother is the only one actually in her retirement community in, in Florida who at 89 years old is taking no medications of any kind and is still you know, running around in very good health. You know? so, <laughs> but none of the people, you know, even though she's treating everybody to vegan food, whenever they come over, they, they don't seem to make the connection. <laughs> but um, anyway, the point I'm making is that through, for me, when I was in Korea, this, 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 um, this effort, I think it's a, a very important effort to make an effort to understand the programming that we've all endured. And it's really, I think, a, a form of wounding. I think as little kids, when I'm forced to eat animal foods, I'm forced to eat the flesh of animals that, are, that have been horribly abused and manipulated and mutilated and so forth, and, and the, the secretions of these animals, um, there's a certain darkness that enters into the body. It's a, a lot of toxins, actually. There's no question about the physical toxins. But I have a whole chapter in the World Peace Diet that talks about metaphysical toxins. You know, the, well, I'm eating terror and fear and despair and sadness and grief and uh, trauma. And it's not just the animal. The animals are traumatized, but the workers. I mean, think of the workers that have to stand there all day for eight hours and just slash throats or just electro-prod animals or kick them. These workers have the highest rates of worker-related injuries. They have the highest rates of suicide, drug addiction, alcoholism, spousal abuse, child abuse. This is well documented. And so they go back into their families and they want to either hurt themselves or hurt others because of the horrible things they're doing. And so they have what's referred to as perpetrator-induced traumatic stress disorder. So what we have to understand is that animal agriculture has been, um, in a sense, uh, falsely portrayed as something that's healthy and all American and what's made the country great and how the West was won and all this kind of stuff. And actually, there's this dark, a uh, very severe darkness in this. That the, there's it's trauma. For, for sure, it's trauma to the animals. They're traumatized probably from birth, and they're hyper confined and mutilated and and and, and, and at death as well. And for the workers. And, uh, and for wildlife, I mean, the, you know, there's a, animal agriculture has been a war against wildlife because it's basically we divide animals into two categories, those that we're owning and using, and then those that are pests, those that somehow interfere with our livelihood, you know? And so we have the Department of Wildlife Services. I know in Oregon, it's, it's huge, uh, but it's, you know, our, our taxpayer money goes to pay for the killing of millions of animals, coyotes and bobcats, and and um, otters and skunks and cormorants, I can go on and on. You just go to their website, it's heartbreaking to see literally every foxes and beavers and every animal trying to live her life out there. Uh, we're um, shooting them from the air and poisoning them and killing them and so forth. So it's, and it's all at the behest of ranchers and farmers for animal agriculture. So again, it's a system that we're born into. I'm not interested in blaming people or shaming or criticizing or judging people. It's a system. It's a system that we're born into, and we all play roles in that. So like I said earlier, when we go outside, we pe see people eating animal foods. Uh, anyone doing that is following orders that were injected into them at a very early age by forces that are literally impossible to resist. Our own parents, it, it's, it's come down through the generations. And so um, the fact that we can, right now, uh, together uh, create a, a community like we have here uh, for a couple of hours, a community thanks to Evan and uh, Lynn and the work, you know, a, a community where we can question 
the programming that we've all endured, the wounding that we've all endured, the wounding that's still going on, that's causing uh, not only devastation to the earth and to animals and to wildlife and to slaughterhouse workers, to hungry people who are starving because we're feeding the food to animals, all people, they go hungry, the war caused by, uh, by uh, food shortages, the, that cause refugees, the orphans, the, you know, all of this is all part of animal agriculture. It comes out of the well of animal agriculture. And beyond that, there's the wounding that happens psychologically and spiritually where we don't want to think about it. It's understood that people who are traumatized do not want to think about the trauma. They don't want to think about it. Just don't think about it. I don't want to, people do not want to hear that when they go to a Kennedy Fried Chicken, they're causing this kind of suffering, right? It's, they understand it's traumatic for the chickens and they're eating this trauma, but it's traumatic for them to hear about it because it makes them relive the trauma of, for, of the first time we, we figured out, I mean, I'm eating a chicken? My friends, you know, kids love animals, right? At a certain point, we may not remember it. Some people do remember it. And it's like, I remember that time I learned I'm eating animals. Oh, God. You know, before that, you don't know what it is. I'm eating chicken. I remember eating bacon. It was like, I love bacon. I was always the first one there, right? You know, having bacon, I was the first one there. I love bacon. You know, not bacon. My mother had said, we're having the flesh of an animal who's confined her entire life in a cage, who's banging her head against the bar, she was driven into insanity, and they pulled her out, hung her upside down by one leg, slashed her throat, she was screaming, now we're going to eat her flesh. <gasps> Can we have oatmeal? Can we, I mean, can I have a banana? I mean, you want me to eat that? You know, I mean, it's hard, bad enough to hear about it. You want me to actually eat it? You know, so. We don't know what it we're, we don't know what it is, and then we find out at one point, and then we just realize hmm, well, that's how the world is. So the beauty, though, I think, is you know, for me, what the only reason I was able to, to go vegetarian, you know, vegan, was because of the example of other people, right? The only reason I ate meat and dairy products was because of the example of other people, because of the community I was raised in. And the only reason I was able to change that was because of the farm, because of Sanwang Sa Zen Monastery in Korea, these examples of communities where people lived in a different way. And so that's what we're doing right now, right this second, we're creating, in a sense, this alternative community and where we are not eating animal foods and we're understanding the reason why. And so we can understand this and we can create a society of liberation, of justice, of equality, of freedom, of health, of sustainability, because the underlying message of veganism is love. I don't even like to, you know, I use the word veganism. It's really, it's just coming home to our true nature, seeing beings and treating them with kindness and respect. It doesn't need a word. I mean, it's like, it's just who we are, <laughs> you know, and living uh, our values, not living values that have imposed upon us, not being in a cultural trance with blinders on and refusing to look up, but actually rejoicing in the ability to look up or to look deeply or to feel deeply or to understand that the beings that we share this word, earth with are worthy of respect, and maybe we have 10,000 years of, of abusing animals, but that doesn't mean we have to continue doing that. We can finally stop, and we can create a world with a positive future. I think we all know in our bones <clears throat> that we need a major shift in the way we're living. That just, you know, we're, we're, uh, you know electing a Democrat instead of a Republican is probably not gonna do it. <laughs> that we need to go. I mean, really, <laughs> we need to go much deeper. And I think the deep, going the deepest, actually, is to look at food, because food is our most, as I said earlier, our deepest connection with, with nature. So I'd like to um, say, you know, when I came back from Korea, uh, I began to understand these ideas, and I got my PhD at Berkeley and taught college and did all these other things. But the underlying um, dynamic, the underlying message uh, in my life from, from that time has been to somehow embody what veganism is. And I think that's the real challenge because it's not about, as I said earlier, being right. It's really about having kindness and love for others, not only animals but for other human beings and understanding the consequences of animal agriculture. So, let me see how I'm doing on time. I've got about 15 minutes. So, I'd like to just share briefly about the five levels of health and, and then talk a little bit about the history of this and then open it up for questions. So when I talk about the five, I already mentioned a little bit about the five levels of health, but the basic idea with that is that when we think about being healthy, right, we think about being physically healthy. 
animal agriculture is devastating to our physical health. There's a whole chapter in the World Peace Diet that goes into this. It's called the intelligence of human physiology. If you look at the, our, the nature of the intelligence of our body, we see very clearly, if you look at our dentition, right, our teeth, the hardness of our teeth, they're not hard. The uh, size of our teeth, the saliva, our saliva is designed essentially to break down complex carbohydrates and that's it. Uh, you look at the length of our digestive tract, it's long, the, the acidity of our stomach, I could go on and on, the circulatory system. Basically, we're not designed to eat animal foods. We can do it, right? We can eat animal foods and not die. But that doesn't mean it's optimal. And it's well understood, we have a wonderful author here, Janice Stanger, who's written uh, beautiful books about uh, the uh, benefits of plant-based eating. And we have other literature coming out. There's a new film called, how many of you have seen What the Health? That's a new one, but some of you, a few of you, yeah. I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix now. Uh, Forks Over Knives is another one. Michael Greger's got a book that's, uh, I think, very good, uh, How Not to Die. It talks about, I think, it's the 16 main reasons people die, and 15 out of the 16 are eating animal-based meals. So, that's <laughs> so um, it's a New York Times bestseller. But anyway, the basic idea is that when we look carefully at our nutrition, nutritional requirements, we see that we're designed to thrive on plant-based meals. I mean, I myself, you know, I have not been to a doctor in 40 years, and Melvin's the same way. It's not, and, 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 and it's not to say everyone's like that, but in general, from the point of view of your, if we look at the risk of disease, of diabetes and osteoporosis and obesity and heart disease and breast, prostate and colon cancer and autoimmune diseases, liver disease, kidney disease, you know, dementia, all these things, people eating a plant-based diet are way down uh, in, the, in the risk factor. And what's filling up the hospital really are, um, pe are people eating meals that are animal-based meals that are cause, cause acidification and inflammation because of animal-based protein, essentially. So the underlying message, essentially, in one kind of nugget <laughs> is that all of us, and it's just beautiful, I think, to just take this in, all of us have been given a gift of a physical body that does not require any animal to suffer to get all the nutrients that we need to thrive and celebrate our lives on this beautiful and abundant earth. That's the basic beautiful truth. Uh, but the other truth that goes with it is that all of us have also been born into a culture where from the time we're little infants we've had to participate in mealtime rituals where we've been compelled to refuse this gift and throw it right back essentially in the face of the Creator and say, well, we're going to stab and kill animals anyway. And when we do that, we not only cause enormous suffering to them, but it boomerangs and comes back to us and we create a world of competition and violence and war and conflict and injustice, and we don't know why. Why is this all happening? Why do we have such a hard time living in harmony and peace with each other? It, it is on our plates. If we want to eat meat, dark products, and eggs, we will have these problems. There's no way around it. It's unavoidable. It, because the, the actual activity of animal agriculture is the driving force behind these out, outer problems. And uh, at a deeper level, it causes the mentality that propels us to create these problems. So physical health can be enormously improved by moving to a plant-based way of eating. Environmental health, I've already mentioned a little bit, but just to say, essentially, according to the United Nations, and virtually there's research coming out on this all the time, as we move to a plant-based diet, we'll use far fewer resources. And we're talking about a lot less. According to the United Nations, it's 30 to 1. I mean, someone eating a plant-based diet uses 1 30th of the fresh water that it takes to make a standard Western diet. So that's, this is very good news. I mean, the basic news is that we can allow the rivers to come back, the aquifers that are being drained to come back, the oceans. You know, we can heal our world if we if, and we, we, we can feed everyone. We, we're, right now, we're growing enough food to feed uh, 9 to 10, some say 11, somewhere in there, billion people. We have 7.5 billion people, so we're growing more than enough food to feed everyone, and yet we have roughly a billion people starving, going hungry, because most of that food is uh, being fed to animals, and then the people in industrialized nations and wealthier people are eating huge amounts of grain and legumes uh, in the form of meat, dairy products, and eggs, and it's causing the food shortages. So essentially, the deforestation, the ocean the destruction, the climate destabilization, these are driven by animal agriculture. And uh, the, uh, so, we, so this, these are the five levels of health, the um, physical health, environmental health, 
and cultural health are the outer dimensions of the five levels of health. All of these are um, harmed severely by animal agriculture. War and conflict come out of this. Environmental devastation causes more injustice, causes more devastation. Our physical health, can, we can never be really healthy if the air is polluted and the climate is destabilized. And you, you understand all this, right? These things are not discussed in the mass media very much. I understand the reason why very well, because my father owned a chain of newspapers. I was raised in the media business, in, in the mass media business, and I understood growing up as a little kid, just listening to him talking to my mother around the dinner table, that you do not run news articles that the advertisers don't like. You don't do that. You run articles that the advertisers like. If you don't advertise with someone else, you go out of business. This is capitalism. This is about money. It's not about truth. Don't ever think it's got anything to do with truth. It's nothing to do with truth. It has to do about power and money, period. So we cannot rely on the media to give us any truth. We've got to get together in this room, in the library, and talk about it. <laughs> We've got to educate each other. And that's the beauty of, of grassroots education, because this is how it happens. It's about building community. And understanding that we've been born into a society that has a lot of toxic attitudes that are injected into us that are benefiting a wealthy elite, but they don't benefit us or animals or future generations. And in fact, they destroy the possibility really for us to have a healthy world for our kids and for future generations. So that's the outer level. And when we understand clearly, and I really highly recommend, how many of you have seen, for example, Cowspiracy as a film? I think it's, I highly recommend that film. Both Cowspiracy and What the Health were created by uh, Kip Anderson, who um, went through our training, our, the World Peace Diet training. We have an online training uh, in going deeper into the ideas of the World Peace Diet. And we've, it's been wonderful to see people create educational programs and videos and sanctuaries and all kinds of things going through our training. And I think uh, if we, Make an effort to understand what these ideas that I'm talking about. You don't have to believe what I'm saying. Do your own research. But it very, becomes very clear that animal agriculture is devastating to the outer levels of these three outer levels of health, the environment, our physical health, and our society. But then the other two levels of health are psychological health and spiritual health. And uh, the World Peace Diet, I think, is the only book, really, that goes into this in depth. And I think that's one of the reasons it's been translated into 16 languages. And Madeline and I have been traveling everywhere talking about this. And it's very uh, inspiring to see people in Africa and in, in the Middle East and in Asia and, and everywhere, South America, um, getting, you know, coming on, uh, um, on fire, really, with enthusiasm when they understand this and to, to share these ideas. Because once we see that animal agriculture is in really injecting into us uh, attitudes that are not in our best interests. Uh, and I'll just give a couple of examples of those. Number one uh, is an attitude of disconnectedness. I think it's very important to understand that the subtext of every meal that we're eating, if we're eating animal foods, is don't make the connection. Don't think about what's on your plate and what it took to get it onto your plate. Just stay shallow, just eat the food. Basically, that subtext is saying just trust the authorities. They know what's best. That's, what's, that's what we're learning. Don't look deeply. Don't listen deeply. Don't feel deeply. Just eat it. So that mentality is the opposite of intelligence. Intelligence is the capacity to make connections that are relevant. When we are, have meal rituals that basically are compelling the entire population to reduce its capacity to make connections, we are dumbing down the entire population. That's what's happening with the animal-based foods. It, it reduces our ability to make connections and it explains a lot, I think, why we allow uh, most of our money and resources to go instead of to protecting the earth and creating context of peace and healing and health and housing and all that to make war and to destroy environments. We would never tolerate that if our intelligence was actively working, right? But we're all, this is, animal agriculture shuts down our intelligence and also our natural empathy, our natural sensitivity, our natural sense of caring. How can we care about cows, pigs, and chickens, fishes, and ecosystems, and hungry people if we're eating animal foods? We can't. We have to just basically not care. We learn to not care. Veganism is caring. It's caring. I remember going, I used to protest a, a couple of years in Monte Rio. They had the, this, um, the, the um, 
oh gosh, the Bohemian Club, the wealthy elite of the world, the, big, the most wealthy bankers and corporate heads and legislators would gather and they had these secret rituals in, the, in uh, Sonoma County. And the very first night they would have their big ritual, which nobody could get in, it was, you know, it was heavily guarded, but it was the, the cremation of care. They would kill care. That's the whole point. That's, that's what it's all about. It, you know, they know if you can kill care, if you can make people not care, then you have slaves and you can run, you can do, you can make a lot of money, you can have war, you, you know. So what veganism is, is just basically learn resurrecting care. <laughs> resurrecting care in our own hearts, caring for ourselves, our own health, and that's a great gift to the world. If we're healthy, that's a great gift to the world. Be healthy, it's a great gift to others. Um, we can uh, be care for the earth. We can care for our loved ones. We can care for future generations. We can care for hungry people. We can care for everyone. It's the best thing. Care. It, it gives meaning. It gives purpose. It gives love. Love comes alive in us. Joy and freedom and creativity and equality and sustainability and justice all come out of that. That's where they come from. They come from caring. It's, the, it's a feminine capacity of understanding the interconnectedness of all of life. That we are interconnected. And it's beautiful. So, the making the connections, number one, because animal-based foods break that connection. And then number two, uh, the mentality of commodification of life. You know, every meal is teaching us when we're eating animal foods, eating bacon or eating cheese, whatever it is, to see, we, we learn not to see a being. When we see a being, we see a thing, a commodity. Buy and sell by the pound. Can you imagine buying worth is how much you weigh, that's how much you're worth. I mean, that's, that's so crude, it's beyond what I can imagine, but that, we do that like business as usual. How can we ever create a world of peace when that's the foundation of what we're feeding our children? <laughs> is that the beings, are, we, they're, they're worth what they weigh. I mean, this is, this is so crass, so it's, it boggles the mind that this is actually happening. How can this be happening? And we have PhD people pretending that they're intelligent about this, whatever it is, you know. I mean, this is like so ridiculous. But this is the foundation of our society. So the whole idea, again, with, with what we're talking about is to simply come home. It's nothing dramatic. It's just coming home and seeing beings when we see beings and allowing the natural sense of, of respect that we have to, to motivate our actions. And then the third one, there's many more, but I'll just talk about three. The third one is the domination of the feminine. That's the key exactly. point. The domination of the sacred feminine. And the underlying idea with animal agriculture, there's two primary actions in animal agriculture. One is you kill them. The other is you rape them. I mean, it's, you cannot have animal agriculture without the forced insemination of animals, of female animals, and the stealing of their babies. That, that is the foundation. That's all dairy, but not just dairy, all meat. These animals are impregnated against their will, their babies are stolen, they're impregnated against, the babies are stolen as fast as possible because the faster you can do it, the more money you make, the more efficient you are. That's what's been going on for the last 10,000 years in animal agriculture. And those who are most successful at being hard-hearted and dominating the sacred feminine, dominating and, and breaking the sacred uh, tie between mother and child, you break that every time. That is not, the mother thinks that's my baby. It's like, no, no, that's not your baby, that's my baby. I own you, I own the baby. I take the baby, I kill the baby. I pregnant you again, I kill the baby again, then I kill you. That's what it is. There's nothing else but that. And so we have to understand that this is not only causing enormous suffering for these beings, for these mothers and these babies who really suffer incredibly, but it, we are suffering also. We, cr it cr we create a culture of repressing the sacred feminine, where we can kill, we can go to war, we can fight, we can dominate, we can have massive injustice, and we can have homeless people, we, you know, all of that, that's because the sacred feminine, I refer to the sacred feminine as Sophia. Sophia was the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. So this is wisdom. This is a wisdom within both men and women. I think women have a little more because women give birth to little babies who are a lot of trouble, but they love them anyway, right? <laughs> That's the foundation of healthy people, of healthy individuals, of healthy families, of healthy communities, is that feminine, loving um, care. And men also have this, the, the yearning to care and protect life. This is, this is our deepest wisdom, and yet animal agriculture is, at its core is shutting that down, 
shut down that, net, that capacity to care, to love, to protect, to nurture life. And again, uh, when that happens, we have a system that benefits only uh, a few and harms everyone else. So for us, the, the beauty is that, the, in a sense, the most subversive, the most subversive action any human being can take in terms of questioning a system of violence is to move to a plant-based way of eating and understand the reason why. Eating and living, not buying products, uh, food and, and clothing and entertainment that, that causes suffering to animals or to human beings as much as possible to live a life where we're minimizing the violence to others. And, I, and the other thing I'll just mention briefly, because I think it's important, is the history of this. So that's the five levels of health, and they're all interconnected. And, and just to understand that animal agriculture is not only the driving force behind the devastation that we see in the outer world, but even more significantly in the inner landscape of our consciousness, at the very deep levels uh, of how we see ourselves and others. So to make an effort to purify our consciousness and to awaken uh, to a deeper understanding of our connectedness with other beings. And to, and to connect with our intuition, our inner wisdom, to guide us rather than outside authorities. And then uh, the other aspect is just the history of this. Very briefly, I think it's important. I have a whole chapter that kind of goes into it in, in a lot more detail. But once we understand this, I think it's very empowering. And that is that about 10,000 years ago in what is today Iraq, people for the first time started herding animals, owning them as property for food. It was wild sheep and then wild goats and about maybe 2,000 years later uh, wild cows. And this was the last revolution in the society that we're in today that we ever experienced because it changed us at a fundamental level where animals did about five things. Number one, animals were no longer respected. They became objects that were used. Other animals became pests, no longer respected either. It also drove and created for the very first time on this planet a wealthy elite class. And this wealthy elite class became eventually, like I, I used to teach college courses in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the ancient Old Testament writings, the ancient Greek tragedies. Now these, these are the oldest writings. This go, they, they only go back to maybe, maybe uh, 3,000 years ago, but by that time it was well established. And so these, this wealthy elite class was called the kings. Remember the kings that you read about in the Old Testament? What were they? They were they were herders, they were ranchers, they were the ones, they owned the most livestock. That's why they were the richest. And because they had, because animals were wealth, and so they were dominating, these few men were dominating the society economically and governmentally and, and militarily. And they invented two more institutions. Sorry, it's the way the first time we had the rising. If you, have, if you want to have animal agriculture, you're going to have a wealthy elite class dominating everything. Then you're going to have two other institutions that came about at the same, right after that. Uh, number one was war. There had never been war on planet Earth until animal agriculture. The very first word for war that we know of, going way back to the ancient Sanskrit, is gavya. Gavya is the first word for more. It literally means the desire for more cows. <laughs> because wow. when these kings, when they see another king, he had a lot of cows and sheep and goats, it was like, I want to get those and double my wealth. Well, they're not going to give up without a fight. So for the first time on this planet, we have these large armies clashing and horrific violence. You can't imagine. You don't want to read about it. Terrible. Like, well, like today. I mean, it was horrible. And I then think. the next thing that, that came out of that also, besides the war, the second institution that came right out of that was slavery. There had never been slavery before, but it is a small step from owning cows and sheep and goats as property and using them to owning whoever lost the war became slaves, owning them and doing the same thing to them, castrating them, using them, impregnating them against their will because you can get more slaves. Slaves are also worth money. And so we had this arising of a very violent patriarchal society. Women also, you know, men get the idea that females are just breeders, right? They're just breeding them. So, so they're there to give me offspring. That they're to give me pleasure. They're, you know, they're. So when we read, like I say, these ancient writings, you can see it's very in black and white right there. Women are bought and sold, just like cows and sheep, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're chattel property because animal agriculture. That's what it does to us mentally. It, it creates that kind of a structure, and then of course for boys. They're taught from the time of little infants to be hard and tough and disconnected, capable of violence towards other men, other rival herders against animals, against women. There's no more devastating force on planet Earth than hard, tough, disconnected men. We have no hope. 
We have hard, tough, disconnected men running things. You know, this, but these are wounded. This is all woundedness. So animal agriculture created that. It was a long, slow revolution. It took thousands of years, but it spread from, the, from that eastern Mediterranean region into Central Asia, to the northern Mediterranean, to Europe. And, you know, they came over here. It's actually been spreading. It's still spreading through Monsanto, through Cargill, through Kentucky Fried Chicken, Burger King, McDonald's, through the IMF, the World Bank, through the USA projects, and all this stuff is still spreading the same thing, and we're born into it. And I call the whole thing the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media, banking complex, right? <laughs> this, this complex. And it works very well to take most of the wealth and put it in the hands of a tiny, tiny, less than 1% of the population, while the rest gets devastated. And so for us to understand this and realize that if we are enslaving animals, we are being exploited ourselves. We are being exploited. That we're, you know, cows are eating huge amounts of meat, right? They're eating fish. You know, fish, fish meal uh, is fed to cows, pigs, and chickens to fatten them up, make them give them more meat. You, uh, milk. You think that they would uh, naturally eat fish, cows? Have you seen cows trying to catch fish? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> no. If they're not, but you know, if you if you do it enough generations, I'm sure the cow, mother cow says, "Well, yeah, we're supposed to eat fish. You know, we've been doing it forever." You know, I mean, so it's the same with us. We're eating foods we're not designed to, and we're being exploited. And, and so to just understand that we, if we connect with our inner wisdom and connect with this sense of harmony that I think is endemic in us, and compassion and kindness and sensitivity and sense of yearning for freedom and creativity, that we'll automatically move to a way of living that reflects these values. And I think it's, I call it the resurrection of Sophia, the resurrection of the sacred feminine dimension in our consciousness and in our society. And I think it is happening today. You know, I'm very confident. I know we're facing enormous challenges. I mean, enormous challenges. We're in critical times. And I want to congratulate all of you because I know if you're here in this room and you're hearing this message and you understand the urgency of the situation, that it's very important for us to question the narrative in our society, question what the, the mainstream media is telling us, question the programming from corporations, and really to question in many ways our own thoughts and feelings, and to f discover within ourselves the natural health and freedom that are our true nature. So um, that's, the, that's the main message in a nutshell. It, there's a lot more to it. The World Peace Diet actually is an audio book. It's 13 and a half hours long. Don't worry, I'm not going that long, <laughs> but I could. <laughs> so, um, so I'll stop here. And uh, bless you all. Thank you so much for coming, and much love to you. For, thanks for, for listening. Thank you. And I will say, you know, this, I will say, like, when I just get back from China, and, um, you know, it's interesting because in China, the, the government of China is um, now, may, has now studied all this, right? And they've mandated that the Chinese people cut their meat consumption by half over the next 10 years. Reduce it by half. And I remember, isn't that great? You know, and I remember, um, when, I was, when I was speaking to the Chinese people, I would, I would tell them how, you know, it's really great in your country, your scientists are in agreement that it's better to eat less meat, it's better for the environment, it's better for your health, better for the water. Uh, we have a big problem with uh, water. And uh, also, uh, the, the ancient spiritual traditions of China, also Taoism, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, they're all emphasizing the importance of eating a plant-based diet. And now your government, even the government has come on board to yeah, everybody should move to a plant-based diet. Uh, and then I would say, gosh, I really wish the, uh, the American government was as wise as the Chinese government. And they would all start clapping and cheering when I said that. <laughs> I think they, you know, it's good to see there are people, there are communities in the world. Taiwan, for example, is another example of a, a very, uh, very advanced. I mean, there's over a thousand vegetarian and vegan restaurants in that little island. And you know, I gave a lecture there. Two thousand people came to hear me talk about veganism. You know, I mean, they're really going so far. They're uh, with organic, and so, so I think as Americans, though, we have. Um, we still have a big impact on the rest of the world, and as we go vegan, it will really help the rest of the world go in that direction, because we're still seen as an example. You know, and so I think you know, each one of us can make a big difference. Really, each one of you makes a huge difference. How we live our lives does make a difference. I want to emphasize that. Thank you very much. And now, does anyone have, I can take maybe one or two questions. I know it's running a little bit later, but um, yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, uh, your world peace diet obviously uh, advocates veganism. But does it also go beyond advocating veganism to advocating eating organic 
eating locally grown food and encouraging people to grow some of their own food. Great. Okay, so the question he just asked is, we advocate uh, eating uh, a vegan, vegan uh, way of eating, but do we also go beyond that and advocate organic, and locally grown, and uh, growing our own food? And I would say absolutely yes. I, I do talk about it in the World Peace Diet, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I should have already said that. Because I don't think really quite honestly, Madeline, I call Madeline is uh, Miss Organic, and she, <laughs> she said, don't forget to talk about organic. But, uh, you know, I think uh, we can't really be vegan in a sense if we're buying food or paying for food that's genetically engineered or that's where it's being doused with pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides that are killing fish and birds and insects. Really, it should be as much as possible organic, as much as possible local, supporting local farms, as much as possible grow your own. We, we lived in an RV for 18 years and we all we could grow was sprouts really because we were traveling every day. But now for the last four years we've had a house in Northern California, we have, we've created a food forest and we're growing, we've planted about 30 fruit trees and nut trees and, and um, uh, vegetables and herbs and berries and all that. So we have this whole farm, we get a lot of food ourselves. And, and you know recycling compost and making it all veganic and no, using no animal inputs of any kind. It's a great, it's great, you know, it's really wonderful to see and to understand that we can feed everyone on this planet on a fraction of the land, especially as we go to more small-scale agriculture. It's actually much more efficient in land use. These gigantic monocrop fields. This is this is doing plant agriculture the way we do animal agriculture. That's an important point. You know, we do. Animal agriculture is based on domination and exploitation and oppression of animals. And when we do plant agriculture that way, which is we do, we use, we use you know, fungicides and herbicides and pesticides and we cut everything down, we don't let anything live, we use genetically engineered, you know, that's not the way to grow plant food. <laughs> that's doing it with the animal agriculture mode. So to, cr to, to create gardens of love, of where we connect with the seeds ourselves, and then think of the, moon, the, the, the cycles of the moon and the planets and then plant and then, and then go out and go, like Madeline is every day, she goes out in the garden and she just looks at all the different plants with love and thinks who needs some water, who needs a little compost tea. She goes out and says, I'm going to go serve tea <laughs> out in the garden. <laughs> and we go out and serve tea to the different plants and they all have tea together. And, uh, you know, and you create a community of life that supports life and you can eat that food and, you're, and that's life feeding life. You know, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. I remember meeting a guy in Hawaii, he's a, a long time vegan and he moved on to some land in, on Maui and he planted a breadfruit tree. And uh, that breadfruit tree grew and it's a huge tree now and he, I remember he gave this talk and he said, what you're looking at right now, two thirds of this body that you see is that breadfruit tree. <laughs> two thirds of the food I eat, that's that breadfruit tree. You know, that, that bread, and, and a breadfruit tree is only supposed to give fruit, you know, maybe one, like for three or four months a year. This one gives like nine or ten months of the year. And it's just laden in fight. The more he loves that tree, the more that tree gives him breadfruit, you know, and he said it's so much, it's like I can't eat it all, but I do. And, and um, so I think, you know, we can develop relationships with plants. We can be fed by the love of this earth. As we love the earth, the earth will love us back. If we fight the earth and try to dominate and kill her, should, yeah, who's going to be killed in the long run? You know, we're insane in what we're doing, how we're acting. And if we, as we love life and love animals and love uh, and, and see that growing food is an act of love and do it in that way, then we're eating love and we will be healthy and we'll be, food will be medicine for sure. Mm -hmm. So that's really true. That's a beautiful, important point. <laughs> this vibration, and when you you can't eat right. death. Right. Take death in your body and exactly. then you vibrate. It's the vibrations that are very important. I have a little chapter on that. That's very and important. And you're taking in the anger, the fear, the pain, the and suffering. Going through, it's going, exactly. through, going through. You're taking it into your body. No wonder you're angry. Exactly. You're yeah, walking around said, with all that energy. Tina Han said, if we're eating anger, which we are, if we're eating animal foods, how can we not be angry ourselves? So the whole idea is that the World Peace Diet is based on the idea that we. Um, connect in a peaceful way with the earth, grow foods with peace, and create a foundation of peace. And it works on every level, on all these different levels. I think I only have, maybe have time for maybe one more. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. do, you have, do you have any advice for uh, um, onset of uh, dementia, and specifically uh, short-term animals? Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> 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 There's something else. I would just say, you know, Ascension is a book by Neil Barnard, Dr. Neil Barnard. Uh, it just came out. Uh, I mean, it's been out a couple of years, but he he made it's a really good book. It's uh, I forget the title exactly. It's a kind of an obvious title. But if you go, Dr. Neil Barnard, B-A-R-N-A-R-D, foods 
it might be a, he has a book called Foods to Fight Pain, and he has another book, a book I think called Foods that uh, for for something for mental health or something like that. But basically, his research and uh, it's based on a broad spectrum of research that Alzheimer's and dementia and most of the the terrible afflictions, and you can imagine, you know, someone lives is living their life and then. And then the most dear, the most important things, like their relationships with their own children, disappear. They don't like, who are you? And you know, this is tragic. But it's it's animal agriculture, animal-based foods that are are profoundly linked with these diseases. And so, moving to a, a plant-based way, organic, uh, whole food, plant-based diet is the foundation for health, mentally, psychologically, physically, culturally, environmentally, on every level. And so that's that's what I would say. Just try to do a, 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 some fasting, perhaps. I think you know fasting can be very helpful uh, to cleanse uh, when we're having um, some kind of physical challenges. Also, all right. I'll take one last. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Thank you. Yeah, and I've written about that quite a bit. There's some about that in the World Peace Diet too. And I think it's very important to respect native cultures. You know, I'm not, I'm not, and, and I don't criticize them in any way. I think, uh, but you know, to also understand who we are today and where we're at in our life today. And essentially, for example, there's a lot of misinformation. I think we were not too long ago in Virginia at a state park called Bridges uh, National Bridge State Park, and there was a Native American. Um, a museum, kind of an outdoor museum there where they had you know, the way that people lived, the hot type of housing they had, the type of food they made, and so forth. And I remember, uh, and this is in the, in the mountains of Virginia, so it's uh, pretty much a four season area. And I remember talking to uh, the woman who was a docent there, and she was actually, um, you know, she was an Indian, she was an American Indian herself. And I said, so the kind of food, and they had some corn growing. And I said, what percentage of the food of these, I can't remember the name of the tribe, but uh, whatever it was, um, what percentage of the food they ate was that they grow in the garden as corn? And she said it was only about one or two percent was, was corn. And then I said, oh, that's interesting. And then what, so what percentage of the food they ate was um, meat and fish? And she said that was about one to two percent. And I said, really? So one to two percent was corn, one to two percent was fish. So what was like 97 percent? What were they eating? <laughs> and she said they were gatherers. They went out, they would live in an area for about four or five years, and they would gather acorns, they would gather roots and nuts and, and leaves, and they, that's what they ate. That is what they ate, and primarily. And then they would move to another area for four or five years, and then they move another, and then at, maybe at the end of the generation, they'd come back to the same area again, by that it had re regained. She said, that's how, how we live. We live basically on plant-based foods. And so, and I've talked to like a woman who's a Cherokee. In fact, she has a chapter in this book where she talks about the Cherokee Indians eating a virtually completely plant-based diet. That they didn't learn a lot, they didn't eat, they, they were not big meat eaters primarily. They were primarily eating animal uh, plant-based meals. And there's also, I think we have to realize, for example, I used to teach um, a co college courses in mythology, world mythology, and all the, all the stories of all the cultures in the world, really, I mean, overwhelming majority, talk about a time, an ancient time, when there was a golden age, or when there was a garden, when we lived in harmony with animals, when animals and humans could, could communicate together. And I think we have a, maybe a, a memory of a time where we lived more in harmony. And I also remember Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, when he was asked by Bill Moyers in that series, uh, he's talking all about mythology in the world, and why do, why do human beings create myths? And I remember Bill Moyers said, so, so Joseph, why do people create myths? Why, do, why does every society have these stories, these mythic stories that explain the, you know, the relationships between humans and animals and the gods and all these things? Why do we, why do we create these, these stories? And Joseph Campbell said, 
quite honestly, the primary reason why human beings create myths is to somehow rationalize killing animals for food. He said, it is something that is so hard for us to tolerate and to rationalize. We have to create story. We have to create, you know, Krishna, the god, the cow god, wanting, you know, being the goat, you know, having, making love with the gopi girls and having dairy. And we have to invent, you know, Jehovah, you know, want, loving to smell the smell of the sacrifices. So we're not doing it for us. We're doing it for Jehovah, really, not for us. And, you know, so we create these stories to justify our own uh, violence towards animals. But I think. The time now, the Buddha had a great saying. The Buddha said, if you're wounded, it's not very smart to examine the wound and say, okay, well, I'm not going to do anything about my wound until I know, you know who shot the arrow and why they shot the arrow and who the father of the person who shot the arrow actually was and how many feathers were on the arrow. He said, look, you've been, you've been wounded, treat the wound. And so that's what I feel today. We can see very clearly, whatever people did in the past, we don't even know what people did in the past. We don't even know what happened on 9-11, right? We don't know what happened in the past. We have all these theories, right? But the basic, we can see very clearly that we're wounded, we're destroying ecosystems, our destruction of, of animals is hard for us, it's bad for our health, bad for the environment. We can all move to a plant-based way of living, we can thrive and be healthy, we can create ways of growing food that are in harmony. We can feed everyone. We can move forward. There's a, door, there's a beckoning doorway that we can go through where we live in harmony with this earth. Why do we try to find ways to avoid that, right? I mean, if we, we can see that we can create a world of harmony. And whatever other people have done, we can be aware of it. But the main thing is for us to understand that we have within us right now the wisdom to create the foundation of a society where peace and justice and freedom and equality are actually possible. And each one of us, I think all of us, each one of us, can contribute to that happening. And I think for each one of us to find what our gifts are, if it's in writing, or talking, or cooking, or like Madeline painting, or making videos, or doing music, or whatever it is, but see if you can find your way to contribute to this. Because I don't think there's anything more important anyone can do to, to contribute to a positive future than to contribute to sharing these ideas in a loving and respectful way with other people. And so that we're no longer part of the problem, we can be part of the solution. And then when we come to the end of our life, which we all will, and it won't, you know, it could be any moment. So to do the best we can to live each day as, as an expression of kindness and respect and to bring a message. The vegan message is really just for me, the message of kindness and love and respect for all life. Just to, as best we can to be an example of that. And I think if we do that, we will have lived a life well lived for this incarnation. And you know, what more can we do? We, we don't know what's going to happen, but we can do the best we can to help make uh, a more loving and, and kind and, and sustainable world. And I want to, again, thank all of you from the deepest part within me, because I know how difficult it is in our society to actually live this way. But in future generations are depending, and our, our own, I think our own futures are depending as well. So again, much love to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to say briefly, uh, we do have copies of the World Peace Diet. I'm happy to sign those. There's Madeline and Intuitive Cooking. Now let's give a hand for Madeline too. She's a wonderful artist. And, um, and also, um, yeah. We have a couple of vegan t-shirts and a vegan bag if anyone wants to post it. Also, if anyone's interested, there's a book that I, I wrote on um, the editor of called Circles of Compassion. It's also on the table. It goes into social justice issues and the connection between animal agriculture. And then finally, there's um, Your Inner Island, which just came out a month ago. And it's on uh, developing intuition. My PhD at Berkeley was on educating intuition in adults. And so this is a, a practical book on methods and techniques and teachings of developing our spiritual intuition. So we have copies of those that just came out also. So I'm happy to answer questions in the back and thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming out this afternoon. Go to eugeneveg.org, see our table in the back after you go to Will's table and thank you very much for your attention.